Hello and welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson and I'm here with the great mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, John Cruikshank, for our very special year in review show. What a year it's been and I'm just so grateful to be sitting here with you. How are you doing? How are, how is our sitting doing? We, uh, you're going to go down the history books, as I said to John, the mayor that, uh, was the mayor that led our city through a pandemic. You survived COVID and have completely, I, you know, you rose to the occasion, John. So again, thank you for that. So with that, tell us more. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and it is going to be our last uh, taping of the uh, uh, mayor show, mayor's talk. And, and I appreciate all the things that you guys have done this year. Um, yes, I had COVID like everyone knows and back in March. And it's interesting because today's actually the eighth month anniversary of me getting better. And so when people still call me that I haven't talked to in that time, they're asking me, how are you doing? And they don't realize that I actually have been fine for eight months. Um, I do like to tell people I'm the face of the pandemic, <laughs> uh, just for fun. Um, but who would have thought that after all this time, we'd still have shutdowns and mm -hmm. lockdowns going on in our communities and in our schools. So, you know, lo lots of things still that we need to, to fix. All right. And we're going to talk more about throughout, throughout the show how we've been doing as a city navigating through this pandemic. But I need to first say congratulations. I want to take this time to both you and our uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Eric Alegria. Um, you have done such a great job that you were able to, uh, you basically reclaimed your city council seats. Um, you were unopposed in November, so you will uh, dis you will go on for another four years serving our city yeah. um, on the council. So I was just wondering why you decided to take on four more years, especially after everything you've been dealing with through this pandemic. Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> so it's the first time that uh, there has not been an election for our city council seat in our 47 year history. Um, and that, that's quite an honor because there's been amazing people that have run and led this, uh, run for council and led the city. Um, so with that, I, I'm very honored. Um, it's been a really great pleasure being on the city council. I really enjoy solving problems and, and working with my fellow colleagues and, and hearing from constituents to solve so many interesting and important issues that we have in our city. So. Um, Running again, I didn't even think twice about it. So we're going to take a look. We're going to walk down memory lane with you, um, the <laughs> year of 2020. Uh, but I want to start like, so start at the beginning, yeah. you know, before COVID. Yep. Um, when you got that big gavel, you know, you didn't know you were getting handed a gavel and handed a pandemic. But you were starting um, off with the city in the new year where we had a lot of turnover at City Hall. Um, we needed a new city manager and you and the council, one of your first big things was to hire um, R. Moranian, who was a veteran staffer. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about how he's been able to, to take on um, as city manager and bringing on a, really a new team, how that's all gone and, and fared for our residents. Well, and, and it, you know, I know this uh, will be airing through December, but uh, the night that we're airing tonight, uh, I was talking to our city manager earlier, R. Moranian, mm -hmm. and he mentioned to me that this was his one year anniversary of being our city manager. Um, which is just crazy how time flies. Um, and, and not to mention, we had two new council members that came on board. And when one of their first acts with the rest of the council was to interview five really amazing candidates. Mm -hmm. R. Amaranian, who was our community development director at the time, was one of them. He had thankfully applied. And, and we just came to the conclusion uh, during our interviews that even though the other four were very qualified people and would have been great city managers, it just felt right to have him take the helm. And not only did Aura come in in an unprecedented time, like you mentioned, where now we've had a pandemic since basically February, March, and now all the way through the year, he's had to rebuild his staff during this time and deal with all these issues that have gone on. That, and these are issues that no city manager in our history has ever had to deal with. And so you think of the dedication and hard work that he's put in with his staff to get us to this point. Um, our city is in much better shape than many other cities around us, and, 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 and that's because Aura has done such an amazing job. And also done an amazing job with the guidance of the city council, of course, with <laughs> you as mayor. So, you know, then all of a sudden we're in March, COVID hits, uh, and every, all, every the city went into sort of emergency planning and city hall ended up shutting down. Talk about that that the beginning of just having to deal with the pandemic and how we've navigated and grown to where we are today. Right. Um, well, once again, 
when the pandemic hit and we were given all CDC issues and warnings and the county health department, all these new things that we had to deal with. And, and um, you know, we, we've been able to adapt to that. I know that there were a lot of city meetings where they went into the weekend and late nights during the week um, to, to put together plans and, and getting information out to people. Um, and not just our city staff for that, but I've mentioned this numerous times that our residents have been amazingly resilient and patient um, because this has been very trying for people. Um, so, you know, just, just thinking back on that, I, I have to say that, you know, it's, it's actually been a pleasure to be a part of that because uh, you could see the resilience and, and the human spirit here on the peninsula. And, and that's, that's meant a lot to me and, and my fellow council members. The city council, the staff, everyone, the community has really come together, yes. which is what we do in RPV. We yes. are all in this together. I think we there do. was that campaign as well. That, <laughs> I do um, remember that now. <laughs> it just came back to me now that we were, we were in this together. <laughs> right. um, we're going to continue to share just sort of the sort of the toll the pandemic has taken on our on, on, on our community, as well as just highlighting all of the great accomplishments that were going on you know, while we were dealing with COVID. At the same time, the city business was going on as usual as far as public works projects and things where they were getting done. I'm, I'm looking at this list here and it's a long one. You know, you have whether it's Hawthorne Beautification, we've got Portuguese Ben Landslide, Ladera Linda, talks of a new civic center, the issue of affordable housing, undergrounding, parking problems, the preserve, all of this. So this is just a very short list actually, I feel like, um, you know, sister city partnership, we could go on. So let's just focus on some of the well, you would kind of have sort of the highlights that you think some of the really important, significant steps taken by the council, um, including, I want to start with the fact that you and the council ran the first sort of in-person virtual, first virtual and hybrid city council meetings. I mean, that alone was, you know, you were, you were pioneers. <laughs> well, I think that we felt on the council that it was important to show that business needs to go on in the city. Um, and it did need to go on. All these things you just mentioned are all really critical projects that they didn't just start yesterday. I mean, they've been, we've been working on these for years and, you know, councils before me. And so you can't just stop all that. I mean, we, we had to continue on. And I think also by continuing on and showing that we're putting in the effort, I think it made people feel like the community is still strong and, and, and doing things together. And, you know, you, you mentioned so many of those items. I, you know, some of the other items that I know are really important to our community. Um, you know, we did a really nice thank you meal program for many of our first responders mm -hmm. and our, and even for some of the, a lot of the essential workers within our city, the, the sheriff's department, the fire. Um, we have traffic signals that are coming to both Palos Verdes Drive uh, East and Palos Verdes Drive South, and then the Via Rivera one at Hawthorne. Um, we've got a flock camera program, which is actually great because it supplements the ALPR, which is the license plate reader program. And we're going to start rolling that out quite substantially this in the coming year. And that actually gives you real high definition photos of people committing crimes. And that information goes to our sheriff's department and really helps them solve crimes, uh, which is really important because there has been burglaries and there has been things that have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and if that. I may add on that one topic, yeah, since you brought it up, um, regarding flock cameras, which is a wireless camera system, and That's right. that neighborhoods can partner with the city, like you were saying, and um, get a subsidy. It's so popular, I think, right now, maybe we're out of cameras, and th but they're going to get more. We're going to work on that, right? Like, I think well, the, we, the availability to that. That's right. I mean, we basically have just put a little bit of money in to start just to see how that would be received and how it would work. Right. And just hearing from uh, Captain Powers and from the, you know, the ocean terraces where they've utilized that it sounds like everyone's very very positive about the program right. so we can now expand that and uh, help other uh, communities or neighborhoods actually implement and install those you did a lot of other uh, incredible i'm looking again at this list um just navigating the city through this the civil unrest piece which we all were experiencing talk about that a little bit more well right i mean we we had a lot of residents that were watching the news and saw the civil unrest that was occurring. Um, and uh, there were a lot of concerns about safety. And uh, of course, we were notified that there were going to be some uh, protests that were going to occur at Trump National. Um, our sheriff's department had uh, taken the precautions to make themselves available at Trump National. Uh, to basically block the entrance, but allow people in the public areas to do their protesting. 
Uh, we did have three weekends of, of protesting. One weekend that I think there were more than 400 or so people there. Um, I actually attended that particular one just to see how things were being handled and what was going on. And I, I found that, uh, you know, the protesters were, were you know, showing their showing us what their thoughts were and but they did that peacefully I think the I think probably the worst thing all was was the people honking and probably the houses next door hearing the honking over and over I'm again. in that neighborhood <laughs> the, you know what the honking was yes. like then so yes um, any other the things you want to highlight when you look kind of reflect on the year in terms of just accomplishments by the council um, yeah I mean I, I think some of the important things certainly being able to keep a balanced budget knowing that the occupancy tax uh, would take a huge hit because of the the drop off of people coming to our well the resorts were short shut shut down based on the health it wasn't that people weren't going to come there they just couldn't come there and Terranea basically mm -hmm. had their front entrance shut for several months um, of course the sales tax were off too as well um, and because of that, our staff was able to work to find ways to, to cut expenses quite a bit. And so I think for me, that, that was probably the best thing that we've done is to help protect our city, uh, but also the work of our committees uh, and our planning commission. You know, they've done all these different projects and um, we, we have city council goals where work, the work that they did and ideas that they brought to us. We're able to now look at all the city council goals of not only our committees and commission but also our residents and have a nice quarterly report to show us you know where the progress is so lots of things still moving forward which is great right how about the progress that was talked throughout the year about the lighthouse and what's wow, happening this with is the lighthouse something that was interesting that kind of came upon us uh, uh, so everyone knows that we do have a civic center uh, uh, action committee and they, they basically have uh, been looking at how we utilize, best utilize our, our current city center where City Hall is to the best of its, uh, you know, maximize the, the use based on what the community wants. And um, while we were talking to the um, Coast Guard about, you know, opening up the bunkers and showing us what they have there, they also mentioned, hey, we're basically not really utilizing the lighthouse property as well. So we are in talks with them at down at Point Vicente at the lighthouse. And maybe there's a way to help uh, preserve what they have there, but also um, utilize that for part of our civic center as well. That's fabulous. And of course, that's that's a big one, the civic center. Well, the, the Civic Center could be one of the biggest projects our city has ever undertaken. Um, so greatly important. Uh, many, many years have been put in, uh, but we still are trying to capture the essence of what people want there. I know there's been surveys in the past, and, and but we are still going to do quite a bit of public outreach to try to get to the right mm -hmm. mix of things. There, there has been a uh, kind of a programming document put together. Uh, kind of what can be done and what the city needs are, um, but you know we still have some outreach to do. So that project, you know, multi-million dollar project, there's some real big ones. Like you've got Portuguese Bend, which when we first did the list, we just mentioned that. But I think everyone, this has been going on for five decades plus. Like, how are we going to deal with the landslide issues? Do you feel like you are you happy with the progress that's being made and the direction we're going right now as a city of getting another step closer? I am. There's always lots of, you know, people always say that governments move at a glacier pace, I guess in a landslide. Hopefully faster than a landslide pace moving. At this, no. Yeah. Um, well, we have a slower landslide. It's not really, it's kind of called a land flow because right. it doesn't necessarily, well, we don't believe that it'll ever do a quick sort of release. But um, no, we're, we're right in the middle of uh, basically looking at the EIR for the Portuguese Bend. Uh, public comments need to come in and that. And, and, um, so we've, we've still got some work to do on that, uh, but the actual design for the features in regards to closing fissures, fixing the drainage issues, and then potentially the hydro augers to release water out of that are the three main things that have been identified as, and so we have an opportunity to see how that, that works and do that in stages. Mm -hmm. Of course, another big project, Ladera Linda. Um, where, where, where is that project at? So Ladera Linda, um, we, we basically, um, that one as well has an EIR document um, and that one will be back in front of the planning commission with conditions and they'll be, they'll be actually uh, 
uh, deciding what the conditions will be on the project and then ultimately, and that, that should be probably middle of next year where we get to that point. And then we also do need to figure out what the best funding mechanism for the project will be. So that'll probably be a task we give to the Finance Advisory Committee. Um, so we're hoping by maybe next middle of next year we're, we're kind of settled in. And if all goes well, maybe some shovels in the ground before the end of the year next year. We, you talked earlier about traffic lights going in, and that made me think about the fact that we should reference what's going on with Western Avenue. There's, that's another big one, like improvements along that from an aesthetic point of view with beautification, but also traffic flow. Well, I mean, the number one thing at Western is, is the traffic flow. Um, you know, really nothing should happen uh, without that getting resolved. And so uh, my understanding is, is that the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, we're the lead agency with that. We are putting together a project study report um, to look at ways in which the traffic can be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that there's a large project in San Pedro going in, the Pont Vista uh, project, where there'll be hundreds of homes uh, built there. And of course, that's going to impact traffic. Um, and there's also, you know, we've got a, it's a Caltrans highway. So that's none, none a lot of, of that's, moving parts. Yeah, in the none of that's there. easy. None of that's easy. Yeah. And then we also understand, and this might be semi news to people, but Caltrans is planning a, a bike path. Uh, route from uh, the entire stretch of Western. So, wow. yeah, so there are some things that we're, we're going to be discussing. Okay. I um, mean, the idea of beautification made me think also of just the city has done a great job beautifying. Look at Hawthorne Boulevard. You must be very excited about that project's completed. My God, we finally got rid of so much of that green asphalt. My understanding is Aura might have a whole bucket of that crushed right. green asphalt Make to it give out necklaces. Of, yeah, necklaces and bracelets and all that. But um, that was one of the things when I walked uh, the community around around Hawthorne Boulevard. A lot of people mentioned to me, when are you going to get rid of the green asphalt? And, um, you know, lo and behold, a lot of it's gone. I think there's still a few areas, but I think we've gotten a lot of compliments on it. I know right now you mostly see boulders and you'll see a few small trees. Um, it'll take a while for the greenery to come in, but uh, we've been told by the landscape architect that once that starts coming in, it's gonna look beautiful. There's a lot of cactus and oh, greenery that there's, it's gonna really fill in beautifully. A very serious topic that keeps coming up, of course, is what to do about affordable housing. Yeah. And you have been addressing that and um, just sort of there's, you know, not to get into the complex process of how there's the regional housing needs are assessed, but just give us a highlight how in the end, the sort of the numbers that they're asking our community to maybe have to come up with, does it make sense and how you're dealing with this as a council? Right, so the regional housing needs assessment, the RENA numbers mm -hmm. as we call them, um, they're currently asking for 638 additional units. Um, and it's not that you necessarily have to build all 638, you have to zone rezone the city so it allows for the construction of those. So we could have all the new zoning, but nobody ever wants to build. You can't force people to invest the money if that's not the case. Um, so I guess for us, so first of all, our city, we actually appealed those numbers. We feel those numbers are, given the fact that we don't have major transit here and we're not a major work hub, um, and our seems, population stays pretty much the same. Our population's pretty much stayed the same over the last 47 years. So for, to be asked for that type of number to us seems pretty extreme. So we, we have sent in our letters to, to the Southern California Association of Governments, SCAG, who actually is kind of oversees those numbers, and we've, we're appealing those numbers. Um, do we think we're going to get very far with that? I don't know. There's probably more strength in numbers. I know there's numerous cities up and down the state of California that are banding together to push back on these housing numbers. Um, and kind of the crazy thing about it is that these numbers were developed a year or two ago, and we've had all these changes since March when, with the COVID-19 and the pandemic and people not necessarily wanting to live packed in and close together. Mm -hmm. In fact, they've shown that it's just better to have more open space and and, and so, um, and I know the numbers in terms of our transit are going down. Metro is actually changing all their bus lines through their next gen uh, planning uh, because their numbers have gone down. And so to use numbers from one, two, three years ago and just expect us to make those changes now seems crazy. And so at very least they should reassess what's going on. 
but in terms of our city, uh, some of our ideas are that, once again, going back to the fact that we can zone for it. So if we allow for junior ADUs. Which is accessory dwelling units. Accessory dwelling, thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, junior accessory, accessory dwelling units where um, houses are all zoned for that and where there's 12,000 homes in our city. Uh, then that would meet that requirement. Well, and if the number is only 638 to zone for and you can zone for 12,000 homes being able to have JADUs, then, then maybe that, that's a good way to C meet our number. City's approaching yep. that. Every month we do City Talks. I want to thank you for being here every month diligently to kind of give us an update of how we're doing um, as a city. And um, But we look at what's sort of the latest City Council meetings, what you've addressed, agenda items you voted on. So let's just take a peek at the last meeting in November. Yep. You were at the 17th. Um, what came up was finalizing what's going to be all of our residents are going to be receiving a citizen satisfaction survey yes. and um, so just what why is the survey even going out what is the hope with this and just let our residents know what to expect um, well uh, so the city council represents the residents and and the only way we're going to know what the residents are thinking and what they want from from their city is to do things like a survey and so the survey has been pared down, I think, to roughly five pages worth. Um, it was eight pages when we first looked at it. We said, no, it's way too many. And I think we're at 41 questions. Um, and it's a wide range of different topics. And, you know, you have three or four questions per topic. Uh, and so it's going to be a great way for our city council and for our city staff to really get the pulse of how people feel about different things that are going on. It's also kind of an, in an without being called a information thing, you can actually get, oh, I didn't know the city does that sort of thing, reaction to some of these questions. Mm -hmm. Because some of the questions are going to be written in a way where you're like, oh, you know, did you know you can get uh, emergency information from our city website? And so now people kind of know that. So it's a good way to kind of give information while getting back information from our residents. So uh, people will be given a, a Q code, QR code, and some links in December during our newsletter, right. our end of year newsletter. And then they'll be mailed out with self-addressed stamp envelope to everyone in January. And so people have about three weeks to respond. And I really look forward to it. I know, hearing. it'll be really exciting to see where exciting. our community's at. And I feel like our, our city staff has tried to really do a lot of outreach, including you, whether it's public service announcements to keep our community updated on what's happening with the pandemic, um, from you know the health and safety issues to city hall being opened or closed or parks, so this will be really a great way to do outreach. And um, you mentioned the website. I always want to say rpvca.gov. Um, go on it. You can find out pretty much everything, and it is the most transparent website. I mean, you can find out what everyone's getting paid. You can find it all out right there. Um, so that was important that you you tackled that. Also at the city council meeting. Um, you, got, you mentioned earlier in the show about getting quarterly reports on goals. Yes. The city at the start of every year has goals. A lot of them do roll over. So um, address what came up in terms of the quarterly goals report that happened at that meeting, as well as um, sort of the takeaways you might want to share. Sure. Well, um, so I think people expect the city council to reflect the, um, what the community want. Uh, just going back to the the survey as well, you know, we we need to get it. We need to get information from our our the residents and and then set goals for our community. And so this is as people have probably seen that these have been evolving. Um, we finally got it where it's color coded, so now you can see which things are you know on schedule versus kind of behind schedule, and it's broken into I think six categories. Um, and we're seeing this on a quarterly basis, and then we'll do a full review. Uh, uh, early next year where we actually get the feedback from our committees and planning commission and then we actually develop those goals so um, you know we, we've got uh, you know several goals in there certainly the Civic Center is a goal mm -hmm. getting Ladera Linda finish is a goal um, you know even taking the satisfaction survey is one of our goals you know getting the the pulse of the community so the things that are on our goals are things that end up being action items on our city council agendas. Right. You also received a quarterly report on the city's finances, and we addressed that again earlier in the show, yeah. especially with what's happened with 
um, Terranea and the businesses in the community and the money coming in, the revenue. What was the takeaways about our quarterly uh, revenue situation? Sure, and I'm going to read my notes a little bit because okay. I know it's important for people. We want to get so, the numbers right. No, I get and it. You're and an you engineer. Can cut away to nice charts <laughs> and that. So the general fund received just over 3.8 million in revenues uh, of the adopted budget. And like I mentioned before, the TOT and sales tax were obviously negatively impacted by this economic slowdown. Um, the majority of revenue sources are still performing as budgeted, which is great. Uh, mm -hmm. Property taxes, which is about half of our revenue source, is still strong, uh, which is good for everyone that owns a home. Uh, general fund expenditures uh, ended the first quarter at $4.1 million. Uh, which is a decrease of 1.8 million, which is great. So we're spending less to meet the lessened revenue so we can actually keep a balanced budget. And uh, the refined outlook will be presented, the financial outlook will be presented in February, March of 2021. All right, well that, yeah. that was very upbeat to hear about that. Um, I'm gonna move on and I wanna hear from you, your mayor's picks of 2020. Um, we're, we're, we're moving around here just because we've got like about five minutes left as we continue on. But I just wonder what you're going to sort of pick on, pick out right now as your, some of your most memorable moments. Yep. Okay, the, first, <laughs> the very first memorable moment is actually coming here and filming City Talk All with right. yourself and Maria and Jeff and Carlos. Uh, I, I'm telling the community this right now. There's no nicer TV organization than RPV TV. So that's one of my memorable moments Thank of the you. year, and I'm going to miss this. Yes. Um, of course, hiring my friend Ara as our city manager. You know, I've known Ara for many, many years, and and um, it was just a real privilege to be able to see him progress and then get to the point where he really did deserve to be our city manager. So that's one. And then the final thing is winning the pie eating contest, <laughs> and you know, having this count this new councilman Dave Bradley come on and and say, I can beat you in pie-eating contests. And I'm like, let's see that happen. So that was amazing. And just to refresh our communities, <laughs> you know, because, you know, this was the year of COVID, we canceled everything, including the 4th of July celebration. And usually the mayor would be there eating pie with the, with the masses. And you've already won it before. So we thought, let's, let's put this together. And thanks to Terranea that donated that beautiful oh, pie. They did extra whipped cream for oh, you and Dave. So and so, but you definitely had that one. And I think you're going to be back here once again as mayor. So you're going to have another shot at it. And we're going to have you in the studio. Uh, on December 1st is the reorganization meeting for the city council. And while this show is running on our PBTV, we'll come and gone. And that's just uh, very traditional. The changing of the guard will take yep. place. What is your advice to RPV's next mayor? I mean, I, I, I don't like giving advice to people just because I'm just, a, we're all different people. And so mm -hmm. I think as long as they're themselves and, and they learn to just make the best of it. I mean, I could have sat and made this the grouchiest, angriest year ever, but why? I mean, people kind of look to their city council to, you know, have some optimism and have some hope. And, and so... Uh, you know, who, who knows how much longer all this lasts. Like you said, we hope for the best and mm -hmm. with vaccines and that. But, you know, th this is going to go as long as it's going to go on. And nobody can predict that at this point. I thought two weeks back in March. Right. You know, the NBA season ended. You're, you thought, oh, wow, two weeks at the most. And then here we are eight months later. So um, I think that people just need to make the best of that. And like this year, this has been a rough year, but this is a foundation for, I think, an amazing future for all of us. And, you know, my hope is, is that starts in early 2021. Well, as we go into 2021, any final mayor's announcements while you're still mayor you want to share with our community here at RPV TV? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> for, first of all, happy holidays to everyone. Um, you know, the holidays are a time to be with our family and friends. And I know that the rules and restrictions have made that very difficult. Um, at very least pick the phone up and call someone that you love. But I would say that, you know, for me, I've really enjoyed being mayor. Uh, it's a great honor to be a mayor of a city like Rancho Palos Verdes. Oh, you'll get to go down in the city's history books as the man that, the man that, and the mayor that led our city through a pandemic. And you did the best job in what could really could be the worst of times for some. And, and uh, we're looking forward to new times in the new year. And I wish you and your family the best. And I'll see you back here in the new year. Thank you, Liz. That's going to do it for this edition of RPV City Talks Year in Review. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah.